Tonight, praise the Lord. Let's come before the Lord in prayer and see what Habakkuk has to say. Lord, in the few minutes we have together, please give us your Holy Spirit, Lord, to understand it. Without him, Lord, we would be lost. And we surely are lost, Lord, unless you guide, unless you lead, unless you show us forth, Lord, your mighty hand. We ask you for wisdom, Lord, not to make us smarter than everyone else, but to make us wise unto salvation and to make us like your son. Please be with us, Lord, as we open your holy word, a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path, and, and there may it be a word in season that would be given to us, Lord. And we pray that it will apply to our lives more than ever as we see this prophet wrestling and, and clinging to you. May we cling to you, Lord, with all our hearts, soul, mind, and strength. May we love you, Lord because you are the God of our salvation. And help us to come to the point of Habakkuk where we wait on you and trust you for the results. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've been talking about Midrash, right? And um, in a very real way, it is a, the proper understanding of Midrash in Scripture will help us understand the more difficult passages that the normal historical grammatical exegesis will get us so far, but not far enough to understand, especially apocalyptic literature. This is where a lot of times, unfortunately, in Reformed theologies and circles like that, they can't make heads or tails about prophetic apocalyptic literature because they're trying to interpret them the same way they would do a historical exegetical analysis of a book or a history book, and you can't do that. Uh, you just confuse everyone. That's what a lot of people throw their hands up and they say, we don't understand it, we can't, it, it, it's neither heads or tails, they just move on or, or go into um, some kind of um, extreme view of um, like preterism where everything's been fulfilled without understanding that there's patterns, there's cyclicals. And a lot of times that's where Midrash helps us understand. So that's for the last session. Habakkuk today, chapter 3. Lord, help us understand it. What a wonderful book, and we're planning on finishing it tonight, so we will end with singing. I was hoping your wife will be here, brother. She's not here today? Oh, no. Well, we'll sing with her. She's, she, she could sing from home, <laughs> and we'll sing from here. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 3. God comes from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran, and His splendor covers the heavens, and the earth is full of His praise. What a wonderful verse that is, and we'll, we'll understand it more once we get to it. His radiance is like the sunlight, and His rays flashing from His hand, and there is the hiding of His power, or literally, that's where the power is hidden in His hand. Before him goes pestilence, and plagues come after him. He stood and surveyed the earth, and he looked and startled the nations. Yes, the perpetual mountains were shattered. The ancient hills collapsed. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushion under distress, and the ten curtains of the land of Midian were trembling. Did you Lord rage against the rivers, or was your anger against the rivers? Or was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, on your chariots of salvation? The rocks of chastisement were sworn. You cleaved the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and quaked. The downpour of water swept by. The deep uttered from forth its voice, and it lifted, its, it lifted high its hands. Sun and moon stood in their places. They went away at the light of your arrows, at the radiance of your gleaming spears. In indignation, you marched through the earth. In anger, you trampled the nations. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You struck the head of the house of the evil one to lay him open from thigh to neck. You pierced his own, you pierced his own spears, the head of his throngs, the storm, uh, they stormed is in, into the, uh, they stormed in to scatter us. Their exaltation was like those who devour the oppressed and secret. You trampled on the sea with your horses and on the surge of many waters. I heard 
in my inward parts trembled. At the sound of my lips quivered. Decay entered my bones, and in my place I tremble, because I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the day, uh, or for the people who arise who will invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there is no fruit on the vine, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flocks should be cut off from the fold, and there'll be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he has made me like hinds feet, and makes me walk on high places, on my high places, for the choir director on my string instrument. What a mouthful, what a wonderful chapter that is, and we'll finish it tonight. Habakkuk is one of the 12 prophets, the 12 prophets, minor prophets, in that they conveyed a message to Israel that they were to be the clay and God to be the potter. Contemporaries to Jeremiah, Habakkuk. Jeremiah, if you want more detail on the history of what was going on, read Jeremiah. Jeremiah speaks of the, uh, the whole time which Habakkuk is explaining here, but he also delves deeply into the history, into the kings, into Josiah's revival, which, by the way, Jeremiah well, was not part of it. It's not mentioned that he was part of, the, of Josiah's revival, which I found it very interesting. There's no mention of Jeremiah in the revival of Josiah. I'm not going to make too much of it, but it's just interesting. But when Josiah died, we see Jeremiah singing a lamentation over the last good king of Judah. You are the clay, God is the potter, and he wants to make you into a beautiful vessel. That's what God's heart was for the nation. It was God's heart for the nation of Israel, but it was God's heart for every Jew, every, every Hebrew, that they were to trust the Lord with all their heart. And they were not to lean on their own understanding, but to just trust him. But here comes the Babylonians. We talked about this last week. And of course, we saw how God was the God of the nations. That even men like Cyrus, who had no interest of following the Lord, was even used by God to bring his own purpose and his own glory by bringing the Jews back after captivity. So you see that God is the God of the nations, the God of kings, the God of of kingdoms, and even though these kingdoms and kings have their own purpose in mind and their own desire, behind it all is the hand of God moving them to do his will and his own purpose. And that is what Habakkuk learned, that in the Babylonian invasion that was going to come, God was chastising his people. He was bringing them back to repentance because they had become self-sufficient, they had become self-centered, and they had become um, the determining factor of what right and wrong was. And God never wanted the nation to be like that. God never intended Israel to be self-sufficient, to be self-governed, or to be prosperous in their own strength, because that's ultimately going to lead to destruction. That's ultimately going to lead to Every every one of God's people who's self-sufficient and self-willed will end up in some form of destruction. And God knows best. And he knows best. And he knows that if he let us go on our own, we will destroy destroy ourselves because there is no other option. There is no other option. The only other option is destruction. God's people should have their joy, should have their prosperity, should have their happiness in the Lord. Now, God is more concerned with our holiness than our happiness. I mean, I'll explain what that means. It doesn't mean God doesn't want us joyful or happy. It means that in holiness, we will find true joy and true happiness in Him. God always is more concerned with us being holy, and by following Him, we will find true joy and true happiness. The joy of the Lord is our strength, right? That is, that is ultimately where we find our joy and our strength. Habakkuk realized this, and in chapter 3, we're told something very interesting. He changes. He changes his whole entire mood, and we talked about this last week. 
in his last chat in this last chapter, it's not a prayer necessarily. It's not a, a conversation with God necessarily. It's a song, but a song that is rooted in prophecy. A song that is rooted in prophecy. And we talked about this at length last week. We took the whole entire time where you had prophets in the Old Testament who brought forth in different ways, different ways of communicating. And one of them was music, prophetic teachings or prophecy or utterance that was given by the inspiration of God's Spirit that came through song. Some prophets use poems. A lot of Isaiah is poetry. A lot of Zechariah is poetry. You know that in your Bible because it's, in, uh, it's indented in your margin. There's an indentation. That's what the, the translator's trying to say. When you get to this part and it's indented, it's not prose, it's poet, poetry. And poetry is always to deal with the heart. Prose is to deal with the mind, right? That's what the, 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 the commandments are not in poetry, right? Moses' commandments, Moses' law, the law of Moses, they're explicit utterance from God that you are to get objectively. You are to know them as straightforward truth. God means what he says, and he says what he means. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's not poetic. You not, can't make sense of any other way. You, know, you can't say, well, what does that mean? It's... It explicitly, right, it is given to us explicitly as prose, meaning straightforward meaning. Poetic, poetically, poems are sometimes in songs, sometimes in, po in poetry form, where there is the true meaning and then there is a deeper meaning to it once you begin to read it and understand it. Some of the prophecies are like that. The songs of Isaiah, the songs of the servant of God, chapter 52 to the end of the chapter uh, 56, you see these are songs, the songs of the Messiah. The, the, the prophecies about Jesus coming and being pierced for us, and all of us like sheep have gone astray, but on him was laid the iniquity of his all. Those are songs. Beautiful poetry. And, they have, and, and, uh, and Habakkuk uses this word, shiganoth, right? And the idea here is this passionate the word can mean wild, it can mean wild, uh, but it's the, it conveying the idea of a deep, passionate, stirring music that as it's, as it's playing and the Spirit of God comes upon you, it, it causes the utterance of the Word of God to come from your mouth and to powerfully speak God's Word as it's being revealed to you. It's a very powerful thing, and you see that in the prophets. You see that in the book of Samuel, you see that through Saul, even Saul, among the prophets. He was among the prophets that played string instruments and prophesied. Elisha, right, in, on string instruments prophesied. On and on in the Old Testament, you see even Deborah. Even Deborah sang a song, right? The song of Jael, the song of Deborah, uh, the song of Moses, right? The song of Miriam. These are prophetic in nature, but they're songs. They're, they're really just songs. And this, this is supposed to be sang, so I don't know how it went. I'm not sure how it should be sang, but I think it, it is something that we should explore as the Lord gives wonderful, talented musicians uh, a melody, a strong melody, a strong melody that conveys God's word. So that's the Shiganoth, and that was verse 1 and 2. In the midst of years, Lord... In wrath, remember mercy. It's a wonderful prayer. He's no longer asking the Lord for answers in a sense of having this conversation with God. He wants God to do something in the midst of his years. In the midst of his years, look what it says. Revive your work, Lord, in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. This, this song, it's, it's supposed to drive passion into your heart. Too many Christians are satisfied with just a, uh, an intellectual faith. Too many Christians are just bound to an intellectual faith that is an exercise of the mind. Now, it does not mean that you're just to come here and check your brain at the door and just have an emotional uh, party. But it is to say, sometimes we make it so intellectual that we think by loving God with our mind, it is all that we have to do. We forget that it's to love God with all our mind, with all our heart, 
with all our strength, right? Basically, your whole self, your whole entire self is to love God. And it's interesting because when you allow the Lord to stir you by His Spirit, there's a passion. And that's what I'm trying to get at. It's not emotionalism, but emotion. Emotion. Uh, too many times, like uh, A.W. Tozer used to say, you know, the devil's very good about bringing us to church and having us be very pious and very reserved because we're Christians. But then we go out into the world and we become this fanatic, emotional person about sports and about our hobbies. And then we come to church again and we become this, you know, I'm a Christian and I don't lift my hands. I'm a Christian and I don't show joy or emotion while in church because, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian. You know, I'm a Christian supposed to do that, be miserable at church and then get out, go out and, 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 and have fun after that. Uh, well, we may not say it, but it is how we portray it. Very little emotion, right? This, you got the old, uh, no offense to Baptists, but the old Baptist reserve, you know, just I don't show any emotion. You know, if someone's lift up their hands or in the flesh. You know, that kind of thinking. Totally, totally extreme. The other extreme is emotionalism, where you just cut up in the frenzy, and you just become stirred up. There's no teaching. There's no Bible teaching. There's no exhortation of God's word or exegetical teaching or understanding of what the text means. But it doesn't matter because we just get it cut up in the spirit. Both are extremely wrong. What the Bible does say is to understand what the Word of God says and then allow the Holy Spirit to express that in your life through whatever it is He wants to express it in. What has He given you a talent to do? Has He given you talent to write songs? That's what some of the old songs were fantastic. Why? Because people knew their Bible and they wrote songs about what they knew and what they learned. Now you got people that don't know anything about the Bible and they, they want to write a top 40 hits. And they get on the radio and they think they're a worship leader all of a sudden. But what the God's, God's Word said is that we're to know God's Word and then express it. And this is what Habakkuk came to. Habakkuk came to the point where he clung unto God, he was clinging unto Him, and now he says, Lord, I'm just going to trust you. I'm just going to, I may not ever see the resolution to my problem. I might never physically see it, but even then, I still trust you. I will still trust you because you're, you are God. You are the God of my salvation. And that's what the title of the message is. Remember the black churches in the early 1900s, early 1900s, late 1800s, were filled with wonderful Bible teaching. And what came out of those Bible teachings and exhortations were wonderful songs, wonderful stirring songs. And unfortunately, before socialism and black liberation theology took over the black churches, they were the most powerful worshipers and most powerful song coming out of the, the, the Christian churches. Even theologians will go to New York and will go find out, like, what's up, what's up in New York with all these great black churches? Even theologians like Karl Barr will go, would go and find out, what's, what do they have? And they would see they had the word, that incredible music, they took care of the poor, they took care of the needy and the orphans, and, and, and even he said, this is true Christianity. This is true Christianity. But the songs, which eventually led to Motown and the wonderful music that came out of that age, came out of churches. You know, Ray Charles and Anita Franklin and all these people, they all came out of churches. All the songs that they sang were just basically retreads from what they were being played in black churches. A lot of times people think that, you know, Ray Charles came up with this great song about Hit the Road Jack. <laughs> Hit the Road Jack was, the tune was, was played in black churches. Nothing to do with Jack. It was to do about the Lord, but he took the music and took the beats out of those black churches and put them in Motown and became real famous. That's all they did. But the real stirring was happening in the churches. Like I said, unfortunately, before liberation theology came along and took over the black churches, social justice and things like that, um, it's unfortunately. But now let's, let's continue to read Habakkuk. In your wrath, Lord, remember mercy. Lord, I'm asking for action. In the midst of the years, in the midst of the years, make it known. Lord, I've heard about your great, your great works in the past. Habakkuk would remind himself, just like many Jews at the time, of the great exodus of the great time where God delivered his people through the mighty works 
in the book of Exodus to the mighty arm of God. And oftentimes they would go back to those stories to relive them and to tell them to their children, to tell them how wonderful God had delivered them and how God with his strong arm made his presence known. But it wasn't enough for Habakkuk. Lord, I heard about those times. But it's not enough. What's enough is doing it now. Do it now, Lord. In the midst of the years, in the midst of the years, make it known. What is so good about learning about revivals of the past where all we look at is the past and never move past that point? And a lot of times, unfortunately to say, many churches just continue to go back to the old revivals and expect that, that if they just imitate those revivals, it would just happen again automatically. So they live in past revivals. They live in the past. The church sometimes just lives too much in the past. And they said, oh, if we just had the revivals of Edwards, if we had the revivals of Wesley, if we had the revivals of Jonathan Edwards and the, the Puritans and the Jesus movement, if we just had those revivals again, then we'll be all right. And they keep going back. And then they start playing the songs of those days. They go back to the songs of those days, like the Wesley songs. And those are great songs, but they think by playing those songs, they're going to relive it again. And the church lives too much in the past and not enough in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, Lord, make it known. What's so good about learning about the past if God's not going to do it again? That's what Habakkuk is saying. Lord, I've heard about these things. It's this great times that we've had as a nation, but we're not there yet. We're not there now. Make it now, Lord. Make it now. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Remember that, that song, the, the, this verse in, in Kings? Where is the Lord God of Elijah? If it's the same God, he can make it known. He can make it clear again. He can revive us again. In the midst of the years, make it known. But Lord, in your wrath, remember mercy. In your wrath, remember what you did. Remember how you were merciful to us. And only God can do that. Only God can be merciful. In the midst of his wrath, he can bring mercy. Now let's go to verse 3. This is where the song begins to stir up. God comes from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covers the heavens, and the earth is full of his praise. Now remember this. This is deep, stirring music. And the first part, up to verse 8, is all about him or his or he. He's talking to, or in the song, is referring to God as he or his or him, right? He did this. He's coming. It's deep, stirring music. God is coming from Taman. The amazing thing is that he, Habakkuk sees the coming of Jesus. This is what he's seeing. This is what he's seeing. He's not seeing some past event, but he's actually seeing a future event as if it's happening within his lifetime. The Hebrews have this term called the prophetic present tense. The prophetic present tense, where a prophet can see past events as future events, can see future events as present, right? Remember Moses? You ever wonder how Moses is so descriptive about creation as if God is doing it right there and then? Well, I think Moses saw it. I think Moses saw how God was creating the heavens and the earth. How did he do it? God showed it to him. God showed Moses how he did it. And Moses wrote Genesis 1.1. You ever wondered how he did it? Like, how did Moses get it so, like, like if he was there? It was God who showed him. How did John see, how does he see the future in the book of Revelation? He was there. He was there, what he saw and what he heard, the book of Revelation says. Well, here's Habakkuk. Habakkuk sees the coming of Jesus, but he sees it in an interesting way. Now, in your Bible, it should have a future tense. It should have a future tense. If you have a past tense, it should have a footnote at least. God comes from Tehran. His splendor covers the heavens. I'm, I'm sorry. It should have a present tense, not a future tense. A present tense. God comes from Tehran. Not God came from Tehran. God comes uh, from Tehran. Uh, his radiance is like the sunlight. He has rays and flashing from his hands. These are, this is the prophetic tense. The prophetic present tense. As if he's seen it. 
Habakkuk is transported in, in through time and sees the coming of Jesus. But he sees the coming of Jesus through a lens of the Old Testament. He sees it through the lens of the Old Testament. But let me give you a couple of examples. This is the Middle East, all right? Taman, Midian, all that area right there at the bottom near the Sinai Peninsula, that's Mount Sinai. That's where the Mount Sinai was. That's where it happened, all right? Mount Sinai is in Arabia, Paul says, right? This is the Mount Sinai where the Lord displayed his glory and power. God comes from Taman. Now, Taman is in southern Jordan, southern Jordan. Taman is in southern Jordan. Mount Paran is that, that mountain range right at the bottom where the Mount Sinai Peninsula is. Real, the, it's near the Gulf of Aqaba. That's where the, 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 the children of Israel went down to see the Lord in Mount Sinai. That's where it's happening. That's where it happened. But then Habakkuk says the Lord comes from there. Well, it happened already. Turn to Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33. Remember, this has happened already. He sees the coming of Jesus through the lens of the Exodus. The lens of the Exodus. And of course, it's important because Exodus has a very important uh, motif, a very important teaching throughout the whole Bible. They had an Exodus. Jesus had an Exodus. We will have an Exodus, not only out of this world into eternal life, but out of this world into the presence of the Lord. That's our Exodus, right? Deuteronomy 33, the Lord came from Mount Sinai. He came from, or in dawn on them, from Mount Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came from in the midst of 10,000 holy ones. At his right hand, there was the flashing lightning for them. When the Lord came to Mount Sinai, right, this whole area, Mount Paran, right, Mount Paran, Seir, Tehran, southern Jordan, the Arabian Peninsula. This is where the Lord revealed himself to the children of Israel. Revealed himself to the children of Israel. Uh, you could also look at the book of Exodus, chapter 19. The whole chapter 19 is the Lord coming to that mountain. Now, when we talk about the Lord coming, right, we usually think about Jesus coming, his birth, his coming again. But we forget the Lord had a revelation of himself to the children of Israel. God comes down the mountain, it says. He comes down the mountain. Moses goes up, the Lord comes down, is what it says in Exodus. He goes up to see the Lord, and the Lord comes down to see him. There's this interaction with the Lord. He comes down to that mountain. Well, Habakkuk sees the future. In light of the past, he sees the future, and he says, the Lord comes. Same area. What's interesting there, I'm going to go back to this map here, the whole area, and we're going to get to verse 8 in a minute, the whole area, that is all Muslim nations today, okay? The whole area, Mount Paran, the Sinai Peninsula, Taman, southern Jordan, near the Gulf of Aqaba, all that area, uh, this is where the Muslim Brotherhood was born, this is where... Um, the radical Muslims are being funded by through Saudi Arabia, through the Wahhabis, which has a lot of Muslim, which has a lot of mosques in, in, in the United States. It's all in the hands of radical, radical Islamists. It's all in the hands of radical Islamists. This is the area where Habakkuk says, this is the way the Lord's going to come. He comes through Mount Paran. He comes through Mount Seir, right? He comes through that area. Turn to Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63. We begin to put the scriptures in, 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 in context. You begin to see how they play together. <laughs> Isaiah 63, verse 1. Who is this who comes from Edom? That's the area. Right? With garments of glowing colors from Basra. Basra is right in that area, right? It's in the area of Jordan. Coming into Israel. The one who is majestic in apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Somebody wrote a song about that. It's a very famous song. I wish they would have caught it in context. Yeah, the Lord's mighty to save. Yeah, what is he, what is he doing? 
Why is your apparel red and your garments like the one who treads on the winepress? I have trodden on the winepress alone, and from the peoples there was no man with me. I trotted in my anger, and I trampled them in my wrath, and, the life, and their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments. I have stained all of my raiments, for the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. Verse 6, I trodden down the peoples in my anger, and I made them drunk in my wrath. I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. This is a judgment. A judgment that comes from Basra, a judgment that comes from the east. As lightning flashes from the east, the Lord says, so will be his coming. Jesus comes from that area. Sometimes we forget he lands in the Mount of Olives, but he doesn't show up from the Mount of Olives. He shows up here first. Why is he coming there? Because there's great threat to Israel in that area. There's a great threat to Israel from that area. The Lord comes from that area. And he's not coming to teach on the, on the shores of Galilee anymore. He's coming to judge the earth, to trample the earth, it says. And even the question is asked by the prophet, why is your apparel red? Why is your garment red? He said, I've been trotting down the nations in my anger. Again, the God of wrath, the God of anger against a sinful Christ-rejecting world that comes against his people. God will one day judge the Muslim nations, specifically here. He'll judge all the nations, but here begins the, the coming back of Jesus. Jesus comes to deliver his people. Okay, so again, he sees it. Go back to Habakkuk. He sees it through the lens of the, the Exodus. Now, what happened in Exodus? Which, which nation did God judge? Egypt. It was so powerful that all of Israel throughout all their history remembers how God delivered them with a strong arm. God delivered them through a strong arm. Now let's continue what he says. His radiance is like the sunlight, his rays flashing from his hands, and there is the hiding of his power are in his hand. I don't have it with me here. The hiding of his power is in his hand. Verse 4. Where's the power, according to Habakkuk? He sees the Lord coming, and he sees the power is in his hand. This is fascinating here, because God is bringing salvation, and he's bringing judgment at the same time. Notice the word salvation all throughout this passage, right? We're told in 2 Thessalonians that on the day that God brings his judgment, his wrath, he will also deliver his saints. He will also deliver the saints. Same day, right? There's the wrath of God, and the rapture of the church coming at the same time. The wrath comes, the rapture happens uh, at the same time. It ushers, the rapture ushers the wrath of God, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. The rays are flashing before, his, the, before him, they're coming from his hands, and that's where the power is. Think of this, the power is hiding, actually says. It's hiding in his hands. Where is the power of God, according to the scripture? Where is the power of God today? Isn't it hidden? The Bible says it's hidden. It's hidden to the wise. It's hidden to the strong. It's hidden to those who are high and mighty, who think that they have no need for God. His power is hidden from them. Why? Because it's in the cross of Jesus that the power of God is today. The cross of Jesus is foolishness to those who don't believe, Paul says. To the Jew, they require a sign. To the Greek, they desire wisdom. To the Jew, it's a stumbling block. They can't even fathom it. They can't understand how that could be. Paul says to the Corinthians, it is the Messiah. I came to preach Messiah and Messiah crucified. I came to preach Christ and Christ crucified. To a Jew, that is a big oxymoron. How can you have Messiah dead, right? We think of Christ, but we have to put the word Messiah there to make it more understanding. Messiah is king. The Messiah is a king. How can you have a king who's dead? That's what the Jews can't understand. How can you have Messiah dead? How can you have Christ, the anointed one, die? Well, to the Jew, that is unbelievable. That, we can't believe that. How could you? 
You can't. They reject it. Right? To the Greek, they go, well, why would a king, well, the Gentiles will go, why would a king die? <laughs> How foolish is that? Why would, I mean, why would anybody want to do that? And they look at the cross and go, it's foolishness. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. But to those who believe, it is the power of God unto salvation. It is the cross of Jesus. It is the nail-pierced hands where the power is. Because he has the power to deliver us from sin, death, and hell. It's through the cross. But it's hidden. The shock of all people to find out when that day comes that the real power, the real salvation was in a bloody cross on an old rugged cross. Remember that song, an old rugged cross, right? Where the Lord died, right? And then the, the talking about the, the crown, right? That the one day we will exchange this rugged cross for a crown. They, they, the world can't fathom that. And that's where the power is. Think about this. God has decided to hide his power. Because people say, well, where's the power of God today? Look, God is so weak, he doesn't do anything. Sin goes unchecked. People do crazy things. People kill people, and God doesn't do anything. Well, for one, God has given them a chance to repent. But secondly, his power is demonstrated right now through the cross. God has reserved his power to be placed on an insignificant object today that the world will say, how foolish, how stupid for you to believe. And you, you mean a cross is going to save you? You mean a, uh, a piece of wood's going to save you? Well, it's not the piece of wood. It's the one who died on the wood, right? The Bible actually says we've been crucified to the world, to our flesh, right? We've been crucified. That's where the power is. You know, salvation the real power of a Christian walk is when you crucify yourself. It, it doesn't make sense, right? To the, the natural person, they go, well, how could you, don't you need to live in order to have power? I said, in Christ, yes, but we need to die to ourselves. The real power, the real power of, of, of Christianity is when people die to self and they pick up their cross and follow him. That's when you see the real power. People just want to grab the power today. They want to have the power of this, the power of that without the cross, without ever self-denial, without ever following Jesus' way. Now, Habakkuk says that's the real power is in his hands. You want to know where power is today? Go to that suffering Messiah, the suffering Jesus. The power is in, 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 in where Jesus was crucified, right? But let's continue. He goes before, before him goes pestilent, plagues. He looks at the earth. The nations are startled, mountains are shattered, hills collapse, his ways are everlasting. There's earthquakes, pestilence, plagues. What does that sound like? Sounds like Revelation, sounds like Exodus, right? It sounds like both of those things. That's why the Song of Moses is, is sang in the book of Revelation, because it's the same theme. It's the same theme. The same plagues come back in, in, in the book of Revelation. Same plagues, frogs, blood darkness, right? They come back and they're replaced. So if you read Exodus and you look at Revelation, you'll find a startling thing, like what um, Sergio was teaching us. You find some, some deep meaning in the fact that, wait a minute, these, these plagues are replayed again in the book of Revelation. And they sing the song of Moses. When we're on the other side, we'll sing the song of Moses. He's delivered us. He's delivered us from the well, wicked ruler, the Antichrist, right? So remember, these are earthquakes, the trembling of mountains. Everything's going to shake. The book of Hebrews tells us everything will be shaken. Everything will be shaken. Everything will be shaken. Except, except, it says, except those who are not part of this world. If you're part of God's kingdom, you're not going to shake. That's what the Bible says. The only thing that's not going to shake is those who belong to the kingdom of our Lord. Right? The kingdom of Jesus cannot be shaken. And if you belong to that kingdom, you won't be shaken. But everything else will. Every nation, everything will tremble before the Lord, and everything will come down. Everything. Everything will be shaken. Now, pestilence, the plagues of Egypt. Look at verse 7. I saw the tents of Cushion. I saw the tents of Cushion under distress in the tents, in the tent of the, cur uh, of the curtains of the land of Medium, we're trembling. Do I have that? I might have to go back to this again. 
I had another slide. Tents of Kush and Tents of Medium. These are Muslim nations. The Tents of Kush and the Tents of Medium, uh, these are the land of Medium. It's, it's right there by the, by, the, by the Gulf right there. The Tents of Medium. Uh, according to Exodus, these were all Arab tribes that live in that area. Tents of Cushion, Tents of Medium, all in that area. But what's going to happen to those? They're going to be in distress. They're going to be trembling. Now remember, the Muslim people, the Muslim people need salvation. Christians never mean to say, oh, we hate Muslims, we can't stand them, I hope they just go away. No Christians ought to say that. But we do say the ideology, the teaching of Islam, the teaching of the Koran and Muhammad are demonic. They're, 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 they're meant to destroy a person, not only the infidel, what they call, but also themselves. They blow themselves up. They sacrifice to Allah. However, they're prisoners to the teaching. There are many Muslims who don't believe this stuff. There are many Muslims who they could care less what it says. There are many Muslims who live in Muslim countries who really don't believe it, who really don't want no part of it. They're culturally there, but they're trapped. They're basically prisoners. Retaliation. They have my family. This is all we've known. God's going to give them an opportunity to get out of that before the judgment comes. And I'm telling you, this century, we've seen more Muslims come to Jesus than any other, any, any other century before this one. More Muslims are coming to Jesus. And guess what? Those Muslims... They're coming to Jesus. They're radical, amazing evangelists who are going to help the church reach other Muslims one day. That's what I believe. I believe those believers who are getting out of those, those Muslims who are becoming Christians, who are persecuted even to death, will become a great blessing to the church, helping us reach other Muslims in the name of Jesus. There are many like Saul of Tarsus who were persecutors of Christians who are coming to faith in Jesus and are coming now to evangelize radical Muslim areas. God is doing a tremendous work among the Muslims. Why? Because judgment's coming. Judgment's coming to the Wahhabis. Judgment's coming to the Muslim Brotherhood. Judgment's coming to Islam. And it's not going to be any great. It's not going to be something that Christians ought to wish for, but it is to say God doesn't, his justice never sleeps. Now, it says, verse 8, it switches now from he to you. Habakkuk's now talking to the Lord. He says, did the Lord rage against the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers, Lord? Was your wrath against the sea? That you rode your horses on your chariots of salvation? There's a pause on verse 9. It should be on your footnotes or on the side of margin. Selah. Think about this. Think about this, right? Many scholars argue about what the word Selah means, but they all agree one thing. It's to pause and consider what has been said up to this point. The, the prophet's talking to God about how he, how God feels about something. Isn't it interesting when we talk about Christian, in, in Christian circles, that we're very concerned how other people feel, how we feel about it, how you feel about it. But does anyone ask God how he feels about it? It's very different, right? God, what do you, how do you feel about my day? How do you feel about my attitude? How do you feel about what I just said? I don't think anybody wants to ask those questions. <laughs> you might get an answer that it's going to challenge you. But the Lord says, I don't like it. Actually, I despised it. Oh, how terrible. It hurts my feelings. Well, you just hurt God's feelings, right? Most Christianity is concerned now with how you feel. Habakkuk's concerned how God feels about something. You realize God is deeply concerned and deeply involved in how we behave, how the world behaves. There's a reaction to God in how we behave, how the world behaves. The last thing a non-believer realizes is that God is emotionally, can respond emotionally to his behavior. They don't really consider it. They never thought about it. You mean God is not happy with how I did this? No, he's not. You mean he responds to it? Yeah. He's moved by my attitude and my behavior? Yeah. 
you realize God sees and knows all and sees all and understands all that he is emotionally stirred by his creation and how we don't worship him and follow him and take him for granted? Well, one day God's going to demonstrate how he really feels about it. And it's going to be described here. But this is, this, is, this is Habakkuk's request. Lord, how do you feel about it? Was your anger against the rivers, against the wrath, uh, against the mountains, against the sea? Verse 9, you, your bow was made bare, the rocks of chastisement were sworn, the mountains saw you and quaked, the downpour of water swept by, the deep uttered from its voice, it lifted its hands, sun and moon stood in its place, they went away in light of your arrows, in the radiance of your gleaming spears. In indignation, you marched through the earth and your anger trampled all the nations. You realize this. God is emotionally responding to what has been done. You realize that when, when Hosea asked God, Lord, are you going to give up on your people for what they've done? God said, no. God said, I'm not going to give up. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I give you up, O Ephraim, the Lord says. I'm not man, but I am God. He told Jeremiah, can a mother forget his young born, his, his newborn? Can a mother forget his newborn? Well, sometimes they do. He says to the Lord, but I won't. <laughs> I will not forget my people. And he was giving Jeremiah this incredible idea that if a mom is so tender toward her baby, right, you moms, right, tender toward your babies, the Lord is that much tender toward you. How can he give you up? How can he forget you? Well, maybe moms would, some earthly moms would, but the Lord is not man. He's God. He won't give you up. He might, the Lord will forget your sin, but he won't forget about you. That's the beautiful part about it. The Lord forgets our sin, but he doesn't forget about us. That's how the Lord operates. And he wasn't going to forget Israel. Despite the sins and despite their immorality, God says, I'm not going to forget you. I am not going to forget you. Habakkuk, remember, this is about... Israel's liberation, Israel's salvation is displayed here. God's going to come and judge the nation. But in the midst of the years, in the midst of the prophecy, the church is involved, right? God's people are involved, his salvation. Remember, the purposes of God for the church and for Israel are bound together. It's like a coin with two sides. You can make a distinction, but you can't separate it. In the salvation of Israel is bound the salvation of the church. We have to remember that. I know replacementism is very popular, and they will separate the two. Even extreme forms of uh, a dispensation will separate it too far off. But the reality is the salvation of Israel is bound up in the salvation of the church. When God is going to deliver his people, he is going to deliver his people, his own people, Right? both Jew and Gentile together. Now, this is what God says. The mountains saw and they quaked. The sun and the moon stood its place. I mean, the power of God to, to keep the sun from... I mean, remember the story of Joshua. The sun stood still. The sun and the moon are at the, at the behest of God. Right? Um, coming, the, the, the armies against Israel, the armies that are coming against Israel, God's going to deal with them in a very powerful way. We're told that in the book of Ezekiel, the Magog invasion. We're told that in the Psalms. We're told that in the book of Revelation, God is going to destroy the nations that come against Israel. Zechariah chapter 10 through 12 tells us that. He's coming against the nations that will destroy Israel. And he's going to do it in such a way that if God is in control of nature, how much is he can destroy the armies that come against his people? Verse 12, God is going to thresh literally march through the earth in anger and trample the nations. That's what you read in Isaiah 63. Revelation 19 tells us that when the Lord comes back, he's going to come back in power and glory and radiance. There's a sword that will come out of his mouth, which is the word of God. And he will basically destroy the armies of Antichrist. And this is in his anger. Verse 13 you went forth for salvation for your people. Notice the word salvation comes up here again and again and again. The word salvation in Hebrew is the word Yeshua, right? Yeshua, salvation. 
is we get the word Jesus. Jesus is the salvation of Yahweh, Yehoshua. Yahweh is salvation. This is about Jesus' is coming, but he's bringing salvation through his son, through the Messiah. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. Of course, he's referring to the Jewish people. He's referring to the Exodus, but he's referring to his people that have his spirit, the anointed ones. You struck the head of the house of the evil, or the evil one, to lay him open from thigh to neck. Now, this is a very Jewish, very Hebrew way of saying he bare them open. When you would strike your enemy, you would crush the head. You would crush the head, and you would expose, literally, from thigh to neck, you would have overpower him. You overpower him. That's what it means. Now, this idea of crushing the head is a very, uh, very consistent idea throughout the Bible. The consistency of a wicked one being struck in the head a wicked one being struck in the head, and you can kind of summarize in your head already some of the scriptures. Genesis 3, right? He will bruise your heel, right? He will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head, right? It's the Proto-Evangelion. The Proto-Evangelion, the first mention of a gospel message is that Jesus will crush the serpent's head, right? Romans 16 tells us God will crush Satan under our feet. Not that the church is going to crush Satan. Forget this idea that you're going to step on the devil and all this stuff. God is going to crush Satan under our feet. God is going to do it. God's going to do it. Judges chapter 5, J.L., right, strikes the head of Sisera, that wicked general, spikes him through with a spike and a hammer, crushes the head, blow to the head, right? So is Abimelech. He's crushed in the head. Well, the book of Zechariah and the book of Revelation tells us the wicked one will suffer a head wound. Revelation 13, the Antichrist will suffer a head wound. Zechariah 11, he will suffer a eye in a right, and on his right eye and his right hand, he will be wounded. There's something about a crushing of the Antichrist that has to do with this. God is going to crush and deliver a blow to a wicked one. Whenever you see a blow to the head of wicked people, it's the, it's the aspect of Satan or the Antichrist being crushed by God. There's a, there's a head blow. There's a, a wicked one gets a head blow. And this is what Habakkuk sees. You struck the head of the house of evil. God is going to deal with the Antichrist. God is going to deal with all Antichrist and Antichrist religions, right? The spirit of Antichrist, the Antichrist, and all things that are related to an antichrist religion or spirit. He's going to crush the head. He's going to crush the head of Babylon. He's going to crush the head of antichrist spirit. He's going to crush literally the antichrist. God will crush Satan under our feet, the book of Romans tells us. No hallelujahs. No emotionality, right? This is, this is the part of it, right? This is, I mean, to read this and to see, man, Habakkuk saw really far into the future. This is written before the Babylonian captivity. You pierce his own spears, the head of thongs. They stormed to scatter us. Their exaltation was like those who devour the oppressed in secret. You trampled on the sea with your horses and on the surge of many waters. Not only did the Lord deliver them from Egypt, but the Lord will deliver us from the evil one. Right? Remember what Jesus taught us to pray. It's not the Lord's, necessarily the Lord's prayer, but it's the disciples' prayer. He taught them to pray, Lord... Right, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, hallowed be thy name. Deliver us from the evil one. Literally, it's the evil one. I know some translation says evil, but it's literally the evil one. He will deliver us from the evil one. God is going to deliver us ultimately from the evil one. Verse 16, now it switches to I. It's been him and his. It's been you. Now it's I. And what I mean by that is there's a statement. That is very, very profound here. I have heard in my inward parts, and I have trembled. At the sound, my lips quivered, and decay entered my bones. And in my place, I tremble, because I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. He realized one thing. There's things that are happening in Habakkuk 
he just saw a revelation that it blew him away. When you read the revelation that happened to Daniel, what happened to Daniel when he saw the revelation? That's right. Nearly as dead. The Lord had to come and an angel had to touch him and comfort him and get up, Daniel, you're greatly beloved. What happened when John saw a revelation like that? Jesus had to come and personally revive him because he was almost dead. I mean, these are not necessarily, you know, these are not Todd Bentley's visions or anything like that. This is, this is real, powerful, amazing visions that God reveals to certain people. And when Habakkuk saw it, he was nearly dead. He says, decay, enter my bones. Like, he was going to die. He was going to die. His lip was quivering. He trembled. He trembled in his inward parts. He realized one thing. The day of the Lord is a day of great distress. It's not going to be good for anyone. But he realized that there's something that's going to happen within his lifetime. Babylon's coming, and there's no stopping them because it's God who's bringing them. Now, how do you equate all that? God, you said you love us so much. You love us with an everlasting love, said Jeremiah. How are you letting Babylon come? Because God corrects his people, and God brings them back to repentance, even if he has to strike his own people with correction. What does the book of Hebrews says? Don't despise the chastisement of the Lord. It is for your good. Just as the father corrects his son, so does the Lord correct those he loves. In fact, by correcting you, he proves he loves you. Otherwise, you're not his. But the ultimate reason for it, he corrects us that we may share in his holiness, it says in Hebrews 13. We have a sharing of his holiness when he corrects us and he chastises us. It's a very powerful thing to think about it. Not that we want to be chastised all the time, but when he does, he proves he loves us and that we share in his holiness when he corrects us. But he's all wound up in emotion because of his own circumstances. He realized Babylon's coming. There's no way to get around this. And I am overwhelmed, Lord. I trembled. I had a peek at this revelation that you gave, and I'm, I'm almost dead. And yet... It's a day of distress for us. There's no stopping the Babylonians. However, it doesn't matter how long it takes. Lord, you're going to do it. You are going to deliver us. You're going to deliver his people because you promised that the righteous will live by his faith. The righteous will live by his faithfulness. Meaning that, Lord, no matter what happens, even if Babylon comes, which they will, we're going to make it. We're going to make it because you promised that if we hang on to you, you will deliver us. I just saw the revelation, and it's going to be amazing. And I almost died. And Babylon's coming. I'm so wound up, Lord. This is, just imagine his, his, his feeling. But don't... People get wound up in emotionality that they lose perspective of what God really is showing them. All right? So there's two things that work against us, our own emotions. Habakkuk wasn't about into getting into full emotion. He was realizing that God is going to save him. Right? He was going to save him regardless of what happened. The second thing that happens to us when God reveals something is the circumstances. Look at verse 17. There are six different, six different ways that God is going to show, or Habakkuk's going to talk about, that no matter what happens, these six things happen, he's still going to trust the Lord. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and no fruit is on the vine, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. When everything goes wrong, Lord, when there's not even food for the next day, right? What did we do? He says, I will rejoice in God my Savior. I will rejoice in God of my salvation. Even if everything's dead around me, I'm going to worship God. Even if I don't see the result of my prayer, I'm going to follow and love the Lord because he is the Lord. 
simply on the basis that he's my creator and my redeemer and my savior, right? He says, though there's no fig, no, no fig tree, has no fruit, right? There's no olives in the olive tree. There's no cattle or sheep, and I won't see the resolution of my problem. I will still worship the Lord. Remember, this is a song. This is still a song. It, it, he's singing and worshiping the Lord. I will still worship the Lord, and I will love him because he's my, he's my redeemer. See, the circumstances are not going to affect his, his worship. His emotion is not going to affect his worship. I might be overwhelmed and distressed, <laughs> And the Babylons, Babylonians are coming, and there's no food, and there's nothing good happening in my day. Yet, I will exalt the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation, right? right? And this is amazing, because think about this. There are Christians today who literally, this is happening to them. Right? It's, it's one thing to say this today in California 2018. You know, if there was nothing good, theoretically, if there was nothing good about it, I will still rejoice in the Lord. There are Christians today who are living that verse, who are saying, there's nothing good about my day. There's persecution all around me. I have no food. I've been rejected by my family, by my friends, by my loved ones. I have no food. There's no figs. There's no olive. There's no vine. There's no cattle. There's no sheep. But I'm not going to deny Jesus. I am not going to deny the Lord. He is the best thing that has ever happened to me. And there are Christians who live that verse. And there are Christians who are saying this exact verse. They say, there's nothing good about the day. There is nothing good about the day from a human perspective. There's no figs. There's no blossoming of anything. There's more persecution coming. In fact, Lord, when I think we had enough, there's more that happens. And yet, things are empty, but they won't deny Jesus. They love him. I mean, think about that. It's one thing to love God in a time of peace. Peace as we would have it now, right? But it's one thing to love the Lord when there's nothing, and there's attack and attack and attack. Verse 18, I have, or I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. You know, the greatest thing we can rejoice, no matter what happens, is that Jesus is your Savior. And ultimately, sometimes, that's what all we have to, that's all we have to thank for. <laughs> There's some days that that's all that you could possibly ever say. There is nothing good about it. But Jesus is my Savior. You know what? That cannot change. You know, in history, God cannot, this is the amazing thing. God came down as a man and died in history. He died in the history of mankind. There's an empty tomb and a bloody cross that happened 2,000 years ago. And there is nobody that can change that. There is no one that can go back in time and put Jesus out of the grave or out of a cross. Nobody can. Take a look at this. God can't either. God can't even go back and change that, meaning that it's fixed, right? It's something he did. It's something that happened. And because the past cannot be erased, Jesus has died and rose again. For whoever put their trust in him has a fixed point of salvation. And no one can ever take that away. Isn't that amazing? And that's the only thing. And even on rough days, and even on the persecution of Christians, that might be the only thing we will ever have to rejoice in. Because everything else has gone to, you know. Gehenna, but the only thing we have is that Jesus is my Savior. And is that enough? You know, one day we'll find out if people that come to church, if people that flood churches today, if Jesus was the only thing they had, will they still follow the Lord? Or is it because of convenience? Or are they getting something out of it? Or a social status? Well, we got a lot to learn from the persecuted world because that's all they have is Jesus. That's all they have today to rejoicing is that is Jesus. There's nothing good about the day. They have no food. They have no friends. They have no shelter. They, sometimes they've been thrown out, left for dead. But Jesus takes care of the little lambs. 
and they can rejoice in the God of their salvation. That's amazing. Because the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And they will live on by faith, right? Look at Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Ezekiel. They live on in faith. They're alive today in Jesus, right? They live on in faith. So will we. No matter what happens, we will live on in faith. Now, the Lord God is my strength. He has made my feet like hinds feet. This is one of my favorite verses in all the Bible, by the way. So forgive me if I go out a couple of minutes on it. The Lord God is my strength. Yahweh is my strength. And he has made my feet like hinds feet. Hinds feet. It's, it's a female deer. Basically, it's a female deer, a hind. It's a, uh, he's speaking of a gazelle in the Middle East. You have these gazelles. You have these gazelles that have little, little, tiny, little tiny hoofs and then uh, they're matchstick legs. I mean, they're real tiny. And they go up, 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 up. And they're amazing, amazing at jumping from rock to rock to rock. And the idea here is there's nothing unstable about their lives, but they keep going up. <laughs> they go up from in, in difficult circumstances, in rocky territory, in things that you would say, man, if I get up there, I'd probably fall down, right? But these, these deers, these, these gazelles, these, these, these hinds, they go up and up and up and up and up and up, and there's really almost like nothing stopping them, despite the rocky and terrible conditions that they live in. You know, it's not something that you would want to move to, but yet they find their home in such a place that they seem to be very much at home. And they seek to be going up and up and up. And the idea here is, he has made my feet like hinds feet, sure-footed. The idea is sure footing. He's made your feet to be sure, to be steady. Remember the psalmist talked about a, uh, uh, he has placed my feet on a wide place, on a rock, right? It's wide. It's, it's, a, it's a stable foundation. You know, it's not this idea that, I don't know, I don't know if the Lord's going to make it today, you know? <laughs> You know, is he, he going to deal with all my, my, my struggles and my mess? Sure-footedness and light-heartedness. Sure-footedness and light-heartedness, right? They go up and up and up, no matter the condition. And Christians ought to be like that. They're to go up and up and up and up, regardless of the condition that they find themselves in, right? And that's how, that's how Habakkuk ended up. Right? He was low, he was frustrated, he was stressed, he was despondent, he was doubting. That was just referring to me, but he was referring to himself. In the valley of despondency, he's now leaping from rock to rock to rock. You ever seen one? You ever seen a gazelle like that? They just fast. And it just seems to be so beautiful. It was joyful. Steady and sure foundation. If we don't stand by faith, we won't stand at all. all right, that's what the Habakkuk's saying. If we don't stand by faith, this is all by faith, because he has no assurance except God's word that this is going to work out. <laughs> right? this, is the, this is the amazing. He has no assurance from his feelings or his circumstances that this is going to work out. The only thing he has is God's word that he promised that he would do that. That's the only thing he has. And so he has to stand by faith. And if he cannot stand by faith, he cannot stand at all. And that's for us too. If we cannot stand in faith, we cannot stand at all. We couldn't, right? If I don't know Jesus in the peaceful times in which we live in, how are we going to know him in the difficult times? This is the time to really know him. This is the time to be saturated in God's Word. This is the time to ingest Bible, eat Bible, take on more Bible, and when you're done, take on more Bible, and then teach your kids about the Bible because they're going to need it. They're going to need it. You know, Ms. Carol always prays all the time in the back that our kids are going to need the Bible in times of difficult times. Teach, that's what we pray for the kids in the back every Sunday, right? They're going to need the Bible, need the Bible, need the Bible. Get that sure foundation, right? Get them... Get them to be like hinds feet, right? It's to know the wisdom of God, the truth of God, and the Spirit of God, right? Because it's not just about the words. It's not just the, the words that we just give them to people. Right? It's not Chinese fortune cookie day, you know? Just give them a good verse for the day. It's the Holy Spirit to empower them to use the Word of God 
to enable them to live for Jesus. So what happened to Habakkuk? How did he go from a questioning, wrestling, clinging, uh, sorry, wrestling and questioning God to this revelation and empowerment to see Jesus is coming and to say, you know what? I'm going to trust him to the God of my salvation. What could have possibly happened to him? He sees his, revel his vision of Jesus is coming and he's singing and he's rejoicing and he's like a gazelle from like Heinz Street going up and up and up and up and up and up and doesn't matter the circumstances, he is exalting the Lord. Does anyone have a guess? What happened to Habakkuk? Don't overthink it. It is so simple. It's going to be he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. There's no other way to explain it. There is no other way to explain it. He was baptized in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. That's why he could say, I will rejoice in the Lord God of my salvation. I will be strengthened by him. I'm going to have joy in the midst of terrible circumstances. And even in the distress that I have because Babylon's coming, I'm going to still trust him because he promised that the righteous will survive by keeping faith in Jesus. What a beautiful book. And he ends with this. He makes me walk on high places. <laughs> In the high places. I mean, not in the low place. He makes me go up and up. I mean, no matter the circumstances, Christians are always to rise above it in Christ Jesus for the choir director and my string instrument. I wish we can sing it. i will be wonderful to know how it would sound. Yeah, <laughs> I know. And uh, Shiganoth, stirring music. Sure, powerful music that described the, word, the, the power of God trampling over the nation. Remember that, remember that song? I think it was Rich Mullins who wrote it. Our God is an awesome God. Um, we talked about it with the worship team to sing it. Um, it's a beautiful song, but it describes the power of God, right? Um, it's the only way. It was through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit as well. And we're going to get together in prayer. That's why I asked Sergio to cut it a little bit short today um, because we wanted time for prayer. And God has given us, well, God has given me a burden to share this. That's why I wanted to share it. That's why I was here. That's why I was able to get off of work. Um, and I pray God gives you a burden as well. But when God gives you a burden, you need to share it. You need to be able to express it, be able to proclaim it. And however way God has given us, well, he's not given us a string instrument today, unfortunately, but um, somebody can play it. Uh, but he's given us our mouth and our words to say and share. Um, I'll leave you with this before we get into prayer. This is a, a poem that I found, and it's written by a Sunday school teacher. And I'll read it, because it may be too, too small of a font for you guys in the back, but it's a, it's a Sunday school teacher Wrote, written a long time ago, and it was read by King George VI in 1939 at the beginning of the year. So, uh, I'm sorry, at Christmas of 1939, right before the new year began. England was in the middle of a terrible, terrible war that they were losing. It seemed like all was lost. And he read this poem because his daughter gave it to him, the current uh, Queen Elizabeth. His daughter gave it to him because England didn't know how they were going to make it. They had lost battle after battle after battle. And it seems like all the Germans were, had to do was just bomb London, and it was over. And he asked the people of England to pray and seek Jesus. And he read this poem, and it was written by a Sunday school teacher. And it became a very famous poem because of uh, because of the king, but let me, let me read it to you. It's called God Knows, and it goes like this. I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, remember, this is the beginning of the year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go out into the darkness and put your hand 
into the hand of God. That shall be to you better than light and safer than any known way. So I went forth, and finding the hand of God, trod gladly into the night. And he led me toward the hills at the breaking of the day in the lone east. So heart be still. What need of life, what need of our little life, our human life, to know if God has comprehension? If all the dizzy strife of things, both high and low, God hideth, hideth his intention. God knows. His will is best. The stretch of years which wind ahead so dim to our imperfect vision are clear to God. Our fears are premature. In Him all time has full provision. Then rest until God moves to lift the veil from our impatient eyes. When, as the sweeter features of life's stern face we hail, fair beyond all surmise, God's thought around his creatures, our mind he will fill. God knows. If God knows, do you need to know everything? <laughs> Sometimes our fears are premature. So good. So good. I thought this poem was wonderful. We ask ourselves sometimes, like, somebody tell me what's going to happen. You know, somebody give me a little bit of light so I can know where I'm going. And it said, you know what? God's hand is better than the darkness that you're going to walk into. God's hand will guide you through that darkness, no matter what it looks like. And he'll make it right. He'll give you all the confidence in the world to know that your hand and his hand is better than any light, any help anyone can ever give. Let's pray. And I'll ask the body to pray and lift up burdens before the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, it's so good to know that in our imperfect knowledge of the future, our imperfect knowledge of the things that happen around us, we have a real loving Father who cares, a real loving Savior who paid a price for our sin, the real Spirit of our Lord in us and through us, to empower us. Even in the midst of difficult times and years, Lord, you are still God. And your hand is better than any light man can give us. Please, Lord, give us your Holy Spirit tonight, Lord. Empower us, Lord, to receive a fresh filling of your Spirit, an empowerment to know you and to walk closer with you. Lord, please don't make this an academic, mental exercise where we just know about Habakkuk and never experience you, the God who gave Habakkuk this incredible revelation and empower him to rejoice in the, in the midst of difficult years and to be like hind's feet, treading in high places. Lord, thank you that you can free us from fear, free us from uh, regrets and past things that have happened to us, Lord, and, and give us a fresh new look, outlook into what you'll do in our lives. Lord, give us more stirring of your spirit, Lord, that we would be stirred and burdened like Jeremiah to pray, Lord, your word is in, my, in, in, in me, it's in my bones like fire. And I need to utter, I need to say it, I need to express it. Lord, I pray tonight. Fill us fresh, Lord, a fresh, a new, a new empowerment of the Spirit, Lord. We want to be, Lord, like Habakkuk, not knowing how we'll make it, Lord, but knowing that you have all provisions and you have all future laid in your hand, a good future, a future that involves the coming of Jesus. Lord, because we know and we believe that the world in which we walk in today, the streets in which we walk in, the places we drive to, will one day will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord like the waters cover the sea. Lord, because we believe and we know and we, we believe that Jesus has come, we believe that Jesus has died and rose again, we believe, Lord, 
that he will come again and that we will see him in power and in glory. Lord, we believe, we really do believe that he's coming. And so we ask you, Lord, that you would give us that burden, Lord, a burden to, um, to express, Lord, your word to people in a way, Lord God, that it's not just mental, Lord, but it's passion, it's heartfelt, it's, it's rooted and grounded in Jesus, and it's empowered by your Holy Spirit. Please, Lord, we ask you tonight that you would be merciful and kind to us, Lord, and give us, Lord, as children, as a father or a, a fish, Lord, that you would give us, Lord, what is good. You would give us the Holy Spirit.